So I'm going to talk about something that um, has been uh, a catalyst in some ways for getting some of these ideas um, to be considered at a, at a broader level. And it's been a test bed for how to think in the kind of way that Nancy's talking about. Because I totally agree with her. This is all about being integrated and having a systems approach to this stuff and not, not sub-optimizing at the individual indicator, but even at the individual sector or issue level. We tend to do sustainability on a project by project basis or a building by building basis or a policy by policy basis. And that's deeply unsatisfying in terms of the outcome that arises. Uh, and so raising up a level in a more, some kind of a more integrated approach turns out, I think, to be very crucial. So we started uh, about 10 years ago, actually 1999, thinking about the next step for our institute, which was trying to do sustainability was to, um, with, uh, with the community, was to start practicing what we preached and start applying this in a very tangible way. And we thought the way to do that was create a living laboratory of sustainability where everything in the building, the paint, the furniture, the carpets, the lights, everything was a test bed for research on sustainability and implementation with the goal of commercialization and market transformation. So getting this out into the community. Building yet another sustainable building, who cares? Just another island of sustainability in a swamp of standard operating procedure. It's really not much use because there's tons of them. Uh, we have to find ways to, they're all ad hoc, incremental, one-off, disintegrated. Not all of them, but many of them. We have to find ways to connect the dots and make this standard operating procedure. So the goal we have with SIRS is actually to be measured in 10 years, whether we've actually made a noticeable impact on the region, not just on our, the building shell itself. So can we accelerate excel sustainability? We saw an opportunity, as un-Canadian as it is, to combine world leader and Canadian in the same sentence. We thought we're allowed to, be, uh, to say things like that because the urgency is high, um, and talk about three areas. Buildings are huge. We have more LEED certified architects in BC than anywhere else in Canada, but it's not enough. And the, the little litmus test here is building cranes. Go downtown, walk around downtown Toronto, count the building cranes. How many of them are, are sustainable buildings? If it's less than 100%, we're failing. And we're, every one of them that isn't is a 100-year long mistake. Right? These are big mistakes because they last. And retrofit is more expensive and less effective than building it right in the first place. So every single building in Toronto that is not a sustainable building isn't just today's problem. It's a century-long problem we're creating for ourselves. That's why new buildings are more urgent than existing buildings. Existing buildings are more important because there's more of them. So retrofit in the end is more important. New is more urgent because the retrofit will still be here a year from now. You don't lose anything. You lose one year performance. But building it wrong, it's a 100-year mistake. So uh, we really have to focus strongly on buildings. Uh, we have to also to talk about community because what we've discovered in the last federal election is uh, a general principle of politics, which is politicians can't change direction without a constituency. They can keep going without a new constituency because they're on a path and we're in highly path-dependent systems. But they can't actually make change if there isn't a constituency that supports it. So if we don't create processes of social mobilization that engage communities and make them supportive of the kind of policies we need to get to sustainability, it's, we're not going to get there. Uh, we've been building computer games as our way into this problem for about 10 years. We've sold it to 18 cities across North America. We know the power of these tools to engage people who are not experts, who are not part of the usual suspects, but are interested in what kind of neighborhood their kids are going to grow up in uh, by using uh, social media is where we're going next, but uh, digital media and gaming and simulation and so on can be a very powerful way. The fact that 5 million people, as we sit here right now, roughly are playing World of Warcraft tells you something about the power of this technology to engage a large demographic. In fact, a very interesting demographic from a sustainability point of view because it's a young demographic. Uh, so uh, we think visualization, simulation, gaming can be very powerful ways to create social mobilization in support of policy change, without which we can't get there. Part three is the most ambitious agenda, and this is the partnerships we need. We need to get the private sector and the public sector, the NGO sector, and the research sector working together to make this stuff happen on a very broad scale. This is that commercialization process I mentioned to you before, but it's also the policy change process and making those things interact positively. So that's the agenda. Um, uh, 
somewhat ambitious. Here's the, the building. And we're not building a building as Ray Cole keeps telling us. Don't think of buildings as things. Think of them as processes over time that change. Occupancy changes, use changes, and you've got to think of that whole life cycle. Uh, and can we make it regenerative? And I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, these are all pretty obvious things. Try to stay within the biophysical flows of the site. Uh, so we've got the air, we've got the sun, we've got the ground, uh, what, how, uh, and we've got the water. How can, we li can a building live off those flows um, and not require external uh, imports? Well, almost. Uh, obviously in Vancouver it's rather easy to do rainwater harvesting. Surely we shouldn't have water supply from the city in Vancouver. So we're not going to. All the water used in the building will be come from the sky. Um, and then it'll all be treated on site in the building. So the water actually leaving the building, the runoff, will be better quality than the rainwater. Because rainwater isn't potable, right? You have to treat it before you can actually drink it. Um, so we are going to be net positive on water quality. This is a building that will improve water. By adding a building, we're improving the state of the groundwater uh, under UBC. Energy, we do better, because that's an improvement in net positive on quality. In energy, we're net positive on, on quantity. By adding a 50,000 square foot building to UBC campus, we're reducing UBC's energy use, and we're reducing UBC's carbon emissions. And we're doing that by a combination of ground source, that's obvious, geo exchange, um, but also from heat scavenging from next door. The Earth and Ocean Sciences building puts 450 megawatt hours a year through the roof, through the fume hoods. We can take that 450, use 150 ourselves, give them back 300, thus reducing their energy use by 300, their steam consumption, and therefore natural gas burning. And our total use in our building is less than 300. So that's a net positive building. Um, and we think that's the new environmental agenda. The old environmental agenda is being less bad. Oh, we, we don't want to be quite as horrible to the environment. We want to you know, make it less bad. No, we think buildings should make the environment locally and globally better. Adding a building improves the environment. That's the agenda we think is important. We're going to have some building integrated photovoltaics. Every horizontal surface in the building will be daylit instead of what we do, which is seal everybody off and then add artificial lights. People like natural light. It affects productivity. We're going to have a lot of that. Uh, PV is expensive, so only about 20% of our electricity will come from the sun. We were going to get all of our ventilation from the wind, natural ventilation. It's actually not hard to do, it, but UBC decided to put the biggest classroom in UBC in the building. We're going to have a 500-seat classroom. That, by the way, is one of the social indicators. Our biggest classroom at UBC is 500 students. Talk to U of T if you want a contrast in the, in, in the large classroom environment. Uh, so 500 is the biggest. We'll have 2,000 students a, d a day moving through the building, which we think is a great educational opportunity. That means it's very hard to do natural ventilation because we're all the equivalent of about 150 watt light bulb of the human body. And so it's hard to do natural ventilation with 500 people in a single room. So we've turned a defect into a virtue, and we're going to have mechanical and natural ventilation on every floor of every wing. And we can turn it on and off and compare natural and mechanical everywhere in the building and see how people, what they like and what they don't like. So we're net positive on energy and GHG emissions, but we're also net positive on structural carbon. This is not talked about as much. It's huge. Um, uh, we should be building more wood to sequester more carbon. We're going to sequester more carbon in SERS than all of the carbon emitted in building the building, all the construction equipment, and decommissioning at the end of its life. Cities should think of themselves more as carbon sequestration engines, because uh, we need that sequestration big time. Um, and their natural venue for that. And surely in Canada, of any country in the planet, we should be pushing the frontier on carbon sequestration. So a building, sorry, a building that restores the environment around it, and then we study. Can, in particular, so we, all of this is research over the whole life of the building, which, by the way, should be about 150 to 200 years, not the usual 50-year planned obsolescence mode of commercial buildings in North America. You know, the construction period for the Cologne Cathedral was 800 years. We, we have the wrong time constant in thinking about commercial buildings. Um, well, we're the, we're the continent that invented planned obsolescence. Right? Two frontiers. System integration, exactly what uh, Nancy was talking about. This is, all this is off the shelf, right? But putting it all together, that's unusual. That's a system integration issue. It's a design issue, but it's also a, commission, a construction issue, a commissioning issue, and an operations issue. And we've got to think about linking all of those four things. And then the behavioral. This is the big 
This is the big frontier. We see, green, we see behavioral sabotage in green buildings. People are sabotaging the sustainability features because they're so inhumane. And the operators are turning off features in lead buildings, for example, because they don't understand them and they're not trained in how to do them. Until we start addressing the human interface in a way more active way, these, we're not going to succeed with green buildings. OK, there is a cutaway just to show the wood construction because we're kind of proud about all the carbon we're going to sequester. We're going to build it for the same price, no zero capital cost premium. Not, this is not operating savings, paying for extra capital cost, because developers could care less about that. This is about building it for no more within the error band, essentially, as a building with zero of these features. Nobody's building these anymore. This is the minimum mandated by the province for all public sector buildings in BC, lead goal. Actual practice downtown is somewhere in between here. We're indistinguishable on a capital cost basis. It does not cost more to build this stuff. Beyond lead platinum for zero is, is what we're aiming at. The tenders are in, construction is underway, so we're fairly comfortable, but we have to actually build it and make sure it operates before we can make this claim. If we can, we think this is a huge claim to the industry. It doesn't cost more to do, if you do it right. OK, so make things better. Make people's lives better. We're going to measure in the building health, productivity and happiness with a goal of continuous improvement in all three for all the building inhabitants. Not occupants who are passive recipients of building systems. Inhabitants who are actively engaged in making the building work for themselves. And to do all that, you've got to be smart. Smart means cost effective and it means adaptive. <coughs> Engaging the community, I talked a little bit about this, gaming and simulation. We're going to build an immersion environment where people can, uh, can see landscapes. People read landscapes in a sophisticated way. You show them charts and graphs, and their eyes glaze over in about 10 seconds. Right? The indicator's movement needs to pay a lot more attention to communication. And uh, it's not with numbers. It's not with graphs. It's not with maps. Yeah, but landscapes, we read landscapes in very nuanced and sophisticated ways. They can be powerful ways of communicating complexity and sustainability. Uh, uh, explore alternative futures, and then uh, collaborate on uh, implementation strategies. So that'll be our decision theater. Web-based, this is the Metropolitan <coughs> Government of Chicago took our software and put it on the web so that people could visit 2040 and see Chicago under different circumstances in the future. They can invent 2040 and make, make a bunch of decisions and see the impact on the maps and, and on certain indicators and then compare different scenarios. This can be a powerful tool for engaging people who don't come out to meetings, for example. Uh, they, we also put five kiosks around Chicago where people could go and actually play the game there and deposit their preferences right in the kiosk itself. We're going to have one of these at Globe in our booth. Um, and then finally, how to make it happen in partnership uh, this is my hokey slide you have to put up with. Um, these are all potential partners, private sector, public sector, NGOs. They all have a different comparative advantage or focus for sustainability. We're the grout that causes the conversations to happen, creating the, here's the hokey part, the mosaic of sustainability. Uh, this is incredibly powerful, creating those conversations among the partners. Okay. While this was all going on last year, UBC decided it wanted to, to take a step up in sustainability, combine operational academic sustainability. This is really hard. Two different cultures. You can see I'm, I haven't made the switch yet in my new job, so I don't have the, the branded uh, you know, PowerPoint slide yet that has the right <laughs> template, because I'm a faculty member who's used to just saying anything I want, and it doesn't matter. Right? So it's hard to combine these cultures, uh, and yet that was the goal. Um, and so we went through quite an elaborate process. And I just want to give you a couple of concepts. What we came up with in terms of teaching and learning, research and partnerships and operations. How do we link all of these things? We explore sustainability and we exemplify it. Those are the two principles. Two cross-cutting themes at two scales. Let's treat the whole campus as a single integrated laboratory of sustainability where everything we do on campus is a sustainability experiment in principle. And it cuts across, we involve students, we involve research, and we involve operations. And then let's work with the communities in which we are situated and try and help create laboratories of change out in the community, university as agent of change. 
This was the release, January 27th. This, these ideas were accepted. Uh, and we now have what's called the UWC Vancouver Sustainability Initiative. Um, and it looks kind of like this. We have a steering committee, three vice presidents, and a number of deans, a student advisory group, a sustainability council of people out in the community. And then this is us uh, with the three offices that represent the three pieces that I mentioned to you. So this is brand new. And by the way, it's all going to be housed in SERS. So we're kind of excited about that. Um, and uh, the, I think my final slide is uh, SERS is under construction after all these years, finally. And so here it is a week ago. It'll be opening a year. Uh, well, uh, we will substantial completion a year from now, occupancy probably end of the summer. Thanks very much. <laughs>